These trainings are created to help people restore urban natural areas to healthy ecosystems by removing invasive plants and planting native plants. Cascade Land Conservancy, Seattle Parks and Recreation, and Tahoma Audubon Society created these trainings with funding from the USDA Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Program. Hello, my name is Sebi and this is Lawrence and we work for the Washington Conservation Corps. Uh, today we'll be talking to you about best management practices for removing invasive species, uh, including ivy doing a survival ring as well as an ivy roll and removing invasive trees and removing blackberry as well as composting on site. All right, we're going to start off with composting on site. And the reason why we do this is because composting on site is a way to make less invasive plant regrowth. It's the best management practice used all around the country in many cities and we do it because it's a way to gain all, to grab all the nutrients from the removed invasives and use it to mulch over for the new native plants in the future. It's cost effective, it provides habitat, it provides organic material, and it's easier. And I found that creating a compost pile is a great way to stay in shape. We're going to start our compost pile by making our first pallet with the largest logs we have. It's important to make these first three logs parallel to each other and then making the second layer of the pallet perpendicular to that first layer. One of the most important aspects of making a compost pile is to make the bottom logs the largest, keeping the plants from reaching the ground. And after finishing the first layer, make sure you make the second layer as tight as possible, preventing any of the invasives from slipping down and regrowing. The materials used for this compost pile is found all around the site. Depending on the site, it may be difficult to find enough logs to provide an efficient and effective compost pile. Make sure you cover any open holes with small sticks. Have one person stand on it just to make sure it's durable enough. Once you've tested its durability, the invasive plants are ready to be placed up on top. Now we have our completed compost pile right here. A few things to remember. Don't make it any higher than breast height is a good general rule. And there are also some plants that shouldn't be on compost piles, including Japanese knotweed and archangel. And if you'd like a full list of all the plants that would not be appropriate for a compost pile, check out King County's Noxious Weed website. When dealing with a massive amount of ground cover ivy, the most effective way of removing it is to make an ivy roll. Doing this will require a pair of loppers, a few hand pruners, and a few people. All right. When making an ivy roll, it's important to roll back and remove as much of the mass of ivy as you can without disturbing any of the native plants that could be around it. And as described before, removing as much of the root as possible is the most effective way. Doing so will prevent regrowth of this invasive plant. And it's also important to shake off the dirt as you're rolling back the invasive ivy. Removing the dirt is going to decrease its chances of regrowing again. As the ivy roll is pulled back, it's important to have one person look over the work that was done just to make sure there aren't any leftover roots. As soon as the carpet is finished being rolled, it's always good to take one end of that carpet and roll over to the other and making it more easy to transport to the pile. Well done. Mission complete. English ivy is near the top of our list of plants threatening our natural area. It's easily distinguishable by its evergreen leaves and its vertical climbing capabilities.
English ivy does double duty against our ecosystem by growing vertically, making it easier for it to disperse its seeds at a higher altitude. It also grows on the forest floor, making it more difficult for native seedlings to reach their potential. To attack the vertically growing ivy, we need to sever its nutrient and water supply by cutting a ring around it at breast height. When doing so, we need to pull the vines down to prepare to dig it out from the ground. And when dealing with the thicker vines, we use a handsaw or a pair of loppers if necessary. To prevent regrowth of the ivy, it's important to remove as much of the root as possible. Grubbing tools like Pickmatics, Pulaski's, hand tillers are the most efficient when doing so. Or just your hands and raw muscle power. Depending on the soil, this guy either be really hard or extremely easy. And when digging or grubbing out these ivy roots, make sure you're aware of the native plants around it and not to harm them. The most effective way of removing this ivy is to make sure you remove it within a five feet radius of the tree it's growing on. And when it's severed, make sure that you don't pull it down because it could be unsafe and it's already gonna die since it's not connected to its source of nutrients and water. So we just finished making our survival ring and now we have just saved this tree. Within the next couple years, all the ivy above me will shrivel up and die. It's a really great and rewarding experience. While doing restoration work, you may come across a couple invasive trees. Two of these trees could include holly, which can be identified by sharp pointy leaves that are kind of shiny and uh, it has red berries. Another one is laurel, which is more of a waxy leaf that is a rounded pointy tip with a light side underbelly. Uh, important thing to note about both these plants is that you should not cut them down unless you can remove the entire root system with it. Um, one thing you can do if you do need to remove invasives around the base of the tree is to trim them about chest height by using uh, either loppers or a handsaw. And basically what you do is you just cut flush with the tree where the branch is. After you've trimmed all the branches, make sure to get them onto a comp post pile so there is no ground contact. Then you can flag the tree and contact the Green City's staff and they will send out professionals to cut and herbicide the tree. Another prominent invasive plant that you will come across is the Himalayan blackberry. Himalayan blackberry, not to be confused with the native trailing blackberry, can be picked out by its grouping of five leaves as well as a very angular box shaped cane. And because the Himalayan blackberry can grow up to 15 feet tall and 40 feet long, we've uh, broken up the process of removing it into two separate things. And the first of that is to actually cut the canes down to about one foot from the ground and pull out all the canes and you can have volunteers or a crew come and do this. There's different techniques that you can use. You can go in and clip them one at a time and pull the individual cane out, or you can clip them all at the base and use a McLeod or a, even a hard rake and 
pull all the canes at once out and ball them up and then you can get it all onto a compost pile. As you may know, Himalayan blackberry is some pretty pokey stuff, so it is important to wear long sleeve shirts as well as good gloves when removing the canes. The thing that we like to do is actually ball up the blackberry, that way it keeps it kind of compact and it actually composts on the pile a little bit better. And so how you do that is you just break the cane into sections and then when you get down to the base and it's all compact, you grab a piece of it and you wrap it around. And usually the thorns in the blackberry will hold it together, but other times you need to like loop it through. And then if you do this with all of them, it not only makes it more compact, but it makes it easier to actually carry to the pile. The second part of removing an invasive blackberry is getting out the root ball. Uh, this can be done with a shovel, Pulaski, or a hand tiller, uh, depending on the size of the blackberry cane and root that you are getting out. Uh, it is really important to get m most, if not all, of the root out as possible. So something you can do with volunteers is have them compete and see who can get pull out the biggest root wad and that is a good way to motivate them to actually try and get as much of the root out as possible and so and so after you get the root out uh, it is really important to put this on a compost pile because if it is left on the ground this will actually sprout and regrow into a new blackberry so with this and the canes that you removed, make sure that they are on a compost pile so that they don't respout. It's also important to shake off the dirt of the roots before you actually put them on the compost pile. Now that we went in and removed all the canes and pulled out all the root wads, it is a good idea to go back through and sheet mulch. Sheet mulching is important because it prevents any of the invasives that we left in the ground from actually coming back up. It is also a good way to restore some of the nutrients back to the ground from all the invasives that we pulled. It is a good idea if you actually have the materials available to lie down a couple sheets of either burlap or cardboard. This adds an extra layer of protection from the, any of those invasives that are left in the ground from actually popping up. It is really important that you overlap the cardboard or burlap so that there is no gaps in between them to aid in letting any of the invasives underground actually coming back up. And like I said, it's really important to lie them in an overlapping fashion, that way none of the plants can actually come up from in between. Now that we got all the burlap lied down, we're gonna have a couple people come in and actually layer mulch on six to eight inches on top of it. And it's really important to cover the entire burlap surface area as well as spilling over a bit so none of the edges of the burlap are actually exposed. After all the mulch is spread out, it's really important to do quality control and make sure that the mulch is evenly spread out six to eight inches. People usually get sped up on this and try to cover as much ground as possible so they leave spots where the mulch is really thin and that is just another place for the invasives that are underneath that might be able to pop up through. It is also really important to do quality control around the edges where some of the burlap might be exposed and make sure it is all covered and that way any of the things that may be underneath can't come out through that area as well.
Today we learn the best management practices for removing invasive plant species. Let's remember the key points of what we learned today. Remember, when building your compost pile, grab three of the largest logs you found in your area, making it the first layer of your pallet. The higher, the better, because the point of this is to make it so the invasive plant has no chance of touching the ground and regrowing. And when dealing with vertical growing ivy, make sure you make your survival ring, cut its nutrients and water supply off, and dig it up right out of the ground. And when dealing with horizontal ivy on the ground, make sure you roll it up end to end, and it should be good to go right on the compost file. When dealing with invasive blackberry, it is really important to remember the two steps. Go in, cut them a foot down off the ground, and then come in and remove the root ball. It is really important to get all of the root ball out to prevent further growth. When mulching, remember to completely mulch the area with six to eight inches to also prevent further growth. It is important when you do have the available resources to use burlap or cardboard to make sure that they are overlapping with no gaps in between and that the mulch goes over the side of the cardboard. When dealing with invasive trees, the main thing to remember is to not cut the tree down unless you can get all of the root out. Uh, with the information you've learned today, uh, you can go out and help your uh, local park or green area.